Hello and welcome everybody to another edition of the Rugby League Roundtable. We are joined by the CEO, Tony Meshtoff, the coach, Shane Flanagan, the player, Aaron Woods, and the journalist, Brent Weed. We are talking all things expansion. Reedy, I'm going to come over to you okay. first off. Where are we up to? We've seen a recent bid from Perth rejected. Uh, where do you see it at the moment? Uh, so obviously the, the expressions of interest phase has closed and they're now weighing up all the bids. And as you mentioned, Jimmy, um, Perth was one of the high-profile bids. Um, the man behind that was a guy named Peter Cummins, who used to be the, oh, he's the head of cash converters, um, so it's worth a bit of money. Um, but that bid's hit a roadblock. So the West Australian government's working work, work, working with Cummins on that bid as well. Um, but there were some issues with the bid where they didn't put forward a licence fee. So the NRLs basically said, no, nah, we're moving on from that bid, we're going to do it ourselves. Uh, and then you've obviously got um, a PNG, high-profile bid. That's basically over the line. You can pen, pen that one in, that's done. And then there's about six, six, five or six other bids from around South Island, New Zealand, Central Queensland, uh, South East Queensland, a variety of bids. But the two that um, are pretty well, well, the one that's set in stone's PNG and then Perth's a work in progress. They're the priorities for the NRL. So with, with, the, with the current Perth bid, um, it was rejected due to financial reasons. Well, I believe that they weren't willing to pay a licence fee to... To join? Well, there's a bit of there's a bit of um, a disagreement over the process, right? So um, they were in the submissions. It asked, um, "What would you pay in a license fee, or what would you put forward in a license fee?" And they didn't put anything. And it had been made clear to them in the process and in discussions that they would need to pay a license fee. So the NRL took that as a bit of a slap in the face. You know, they they told them you need to at some point you need to pay a license fee. Then they actually asked how much they pay, and they didn't put anything. So they took that as well. You can't be that keen to come into the, the comp if you're not willing to pay a licence fee. Because, Tony, you know this, I mean, the clubs are, you know, that licence fee would, 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 part of that would go towards appeasing the clubs because the clubs, if there's going to be expansion, the clubs want some form of um, payoff for that. Well, well, can I ask you, Tony, why do the clubs need a payoff? Why do the clubs even need a, um, I, I guess, to be be told about this, if, if we've got the governing body running things for the greater good of the game, why yeah. do the clubs even need to be consulted? Because ultimately the clubs have to vote um, to get this across the line. So we're the stakeholders. So we haven't seen anything at a club level or a CEO level yet around um, financial figures or we actually didn't put forward, as the NRL put forward, um, um, uh, the licensing fee. So... Look, at the end of the day, it come, does come down to finances. Um, the NRL will be running it. Obviously, there'll be a there'll be a point where it'll be presented to us. Um, we're saying it's nearly across the line, but the clubs have to vote on it. Well, so um, what people don't understand, and, and Tony, know this is the clubs actually own the game, right? So the ARL com commission is made up of the seventeen clubs and the two states, so nineteen members, um, and in effect, they own the game. So the game, just so the game got valued at. During COVID, it got valued at about $3 billion. So if you divide that, say, 19 ways, it's about $150 million each that, that, that that's worth to each club. So then if you're going to go and then dilute that by adding clubs to the comp, that dilutes their share of the value. So the NRL's view is if we're going to give you a something that's worth $150 million, we want something in return. We're not just going to hand it over to you. Is there an estimated amount that they want, the clubs want? Well, from they, this? they were told, Perth were told um, around the $20 million figure the licence fee would be. Surely the idea would be, okay, look, it might, it might affect us in the short term, devalue you, but in the long run, it, it would add to the popularity and therefore the financial value of well, that's the game, hope, the product, and that's then the therefore the clubs as well. Yeah, I, I think, Jimmy, everyone wants to expand the game. Everyone knows by expanding the game, the broadcast deal will be larger and we ultimately there'll be more money for everyone. So the clubs aren't short-sighted, but I think it's the whole financial package which we haven't seen for PNG and we haven't obviously seen it for the Western Bears either. So it'd be interesting when that comes to the table. We will be consultant and there's a decision to make. But, but ultimately is the goal to get to, to 20 teams? Because we, we're at 17 at the, at the minute, so we've naturally got to get to 18, but then talk of two, PNG and Perth. Uh, I don't know if a 19... No, no, they'll go to 20. The, the, Pete, Pete Valenti's been pretty open about that. They'd like to be at 20 teams by... in the lead-up to the Brisbane Olympics. So... Uh, the, 20, 32? 20, 30, 20, 32. So is, is it going to be one, then two straight away? Or so the idea one, would one? be you go... Um, the original idea was Perth in 27, 
PNG and 28. Now, the issues with the Perth bid, that may have an impact on that. And then you'd look at bringing in another team around 2030, 2032. But um, I still think they're keen. They're obviously still keen to go to Perth. And they're talking about actually running the club themselves. So a bit like the AFL do with GWS and Tasmania, where the NRL controls the club, um, in it, at least in its initial stage. And then maybe down the track they sell it to an investor. But initially, because of this hurdle they've hit, they're talking that uh, I believe they've... Um, They've uh, spoken to the government about this because you need WA government support and they've spoken to the WA government about them actually running the club uh, and being in control of the club themselves, the NRL, um, and that would get Perth over the line. Do they still have to pay that fee to come in if the NRL are in control well, of the no, club? Well, no, because the NRL controls it, so no, that fee wouldn't. And then maybe down the track, as I said, you sell it and you share that what you make from that amongst kind the Kind of like what they did with the Gold Coast. So they took over control of the well, team yeah. and then they've sold sold it to Frizzell. Yeah. 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 T- Tony, do you see much more opposition from the clubs? The, all the clubs want um, is transparency. Um, and that's what we're, we've spoken to Andrew Abdo at our CEO meetings. Um, Peter Valenis hasn't been to any of the meetings, but he obviously will be. That's all we want. Like, we're not saying we haven't banged the table on money demands at all. So I think that's probably um, something we haven't done. So we're waiting to see what the the final presentation is and then we'll make a decision from there. But look, we're all motivated to expand the comp because we know the broadcast deal is so important. They get into 20 teams. The understanding previous to me was that there'll be a better broadcast deal. So therefore, there'll be more money for everyone. It's not just the clubs, there'll be more money in the game. And I think from a, um, a game development point of view and growing participation, we need more money in the game. Well, if we're going to get to three more teams, that's going to be 105 uh First grade players in the squad's a top thirty flano. Do we have enough? We don't at the moment, but you know, I think there should be a bit of a plan put in place, you know, pretty soon. Um, you know, we look at, you know, some players coming from AFL, uh, and the transition there. Oh, sorry, not AFL, from uh, Union. And um, I think there should be some, you know, I read on the weekend um, that there should be some allowance, salary cap allowance for those type of players, union players, to come across. Yeah. At a to- at, especially now at the moment, you know, there's some lawsuits going on and um, it's a good time to get, you know, pinch some good ones. We see the Roosters have got a good one. Um, you know, we're actually, you know, pretty close to get one ourselves. So, um, if that was a cap advantage, um, <laughs> <laughs> was that the, <laughs> yeah, um, so <laughs> <Everyone packed up. laughs> if you, if you the, increase that pool of players, um, I think it's going to be important. So obviously, you know, we saw what happened with the Dolphins come in. There was a bit of a, you know, everyone was sort of trying to protect the ones that they needed to and the Dolphins did a really good job in their first couple of years about recruiting. But, you know, the next step is going to be hard again. So we need to be able to increase the playing group. Like if we had 35 full-time players out of our, and then a sup list, um, it's five more players that we're giving full-time training to. So there's more hope that they can be uh, in our role So you, you think the clubs now should be able to carry more full-time players in order to help with expansion yeah, in I the think, future? I think definitely a couple, yes. Um, you know, the supplementary list is a tricky one um, because you can only give training weeks to some players and then there's five players that get 85000 a fixed rate. Um, so I think we need to look at it. Um, you know, once the expansion model is put in place, which I think will be pretty soon, then we need to start to look at, okay, how do we increase the number of plays in that NRL pool? And we need to give them full-time, whole, yeah, yeah. We need to give them full-time training. Is it something that you're conscious of now when you're negotiating a player's deal that you'd want to see them, t- or t- like if you've got an exciting young prospect, you want to tie them up post-expansion? Definitely. Um, you know, our really elite young kids coming out, you know, that we're looking at two and three year deals and, you know, once, you know, there's some exact dates of when these sides are going to come in, clubs will definitely, you know, corral their best players and their best juniors and so they're untouchable um, because, you know, they just don't want to lose one of their good kids because there will be more money in the game. So we understand that, you know, some of those players, maybe just not the top elite ones, the ones underneath will go to other clubs. So you need to be really careful and smart in your recruitment. We, we had a strategy to sign a lot of players up because of that, like Paseca and, and Hamolo as well. We, we actually signed them on long-term contracts knowing new clubs are coming in and juniors as well. Yeah, because the, any 
or they could become a marquee player. Where probably those two players in particular, uh, probably not marquee currently speaking at Manly, but they could become marquee somewhere else. He didn't sign them up because of new teams clubbing him. He signed them up because he knew I was coming to get them. <laughs> <laughs> I know, stop trying to text the Manly players and be their friend. No, we're going to put you in an ADL on you because they, you I think they're your friends, they're not your friends. I only texted him. I had a text. Tom and Polar. Yeah. I had a text. Clint's head off. <laughs> it's interesting you know he's about um, where you're getting the players from. I think we saw PNG on the weekend, right? They, they look promising. They look like some guys here with a bit of talent and they're going to get a lot of money from the federal government for this PNG franchise, $600 million over 10 years. And a lot of that is going to be spent in pathways in the Pacific. The idea is half of that goes to the team, half goes towards pathways and programs in the Pacific. Uh, and you imagine those kids in five years' time when PNG comes in in 28, some of those guys coming through this. You saw the, as I said, the talent. Schoolboys had a draw. The schoolboys yeah. had a draw, that's yeah. right, Australian right. schoolboys. So in five years' time, hopefully PNG is a real breeding ground. Then if you spend money in the Pacific, maybe you get some of those guys who get a rugby out of the Pacific who would normally go off and play rugby union. Maybe they grab some of those guys for these teams as well. It, it yeah. does seem like a really um, untapped wealth of players with with a lot of potential but they don't have that genuine pathway no. system in but there's plenty of areas like that we look at victoria we look at perth like if we put actual resources into developing what seems to be promised talent i think we will see the results in, in the immediate though like woodsy i'll, I'll ask you like they're going to have to sign players from australia new zealand and potentially the super league as well is it <laughs> Well, my, my, my question was going to ask actually, Reedy, really, with the Dolphins, how, when they got told they were going to be in a competition, how long till they were going to they, be playing? I think 18 months. Yeah, I think you need a bit longer so you can set up the pathways to develop well, that's why and yeah. to be but able to sign they players. Just, they can't just rely on pathways. They've got to sign. No, they're not going to sign some they players. They're not yeah. going to have like a new... Because how many players did they try to attack and they just couldn't get? The Dolphins hate a heap. Remember yeah. the, that documentary that a whiteboard full of names? That's not I reckon they would have got probably five of those blokes. James, I, I don't think PNG need to look outside the circle too much. No, not at all. If you have a look at the PNG side that was just the 21 best players, I think there's about, you know, 12 of them that are playing in the English, English Super League. And you got, um, you know, you got young Lamb that's um, been over there and half that's done a really good job. Um, and then the current crop that played yesterday um, against Australia in four or five years' time, um, they'll be able to pick enough PNG boys to be competitive. Well, I don't think we need a sprinkling you, of Australians. You, you don't think there'll be Australians or Kiwis or English players on the recruitment? Well, they're going to need well, that. They'll be on the recruitment list. They'll, they'll yeah. be on the recruitment list. I, I don't think they can solely rely on um, the, the, the players that they currently have in, in the system. The, the PNG to, side that they will trot out um, in this specific thing would win an NRL game. They will win, yep. they would win a couple of NRL games, without a doubt. If you have a look at it, that PNG side that they will trot out, the yep. hooker's a, a quality player, the halfback can hold his hands up, um, and they've got some good forwards. They will win some NRL games if they were put in, and that side that we see. The other thing that's interesting about the PNG, GB, talking about tax tax incentives to go and play up there, you know, talking about blokes almost paying no tax. So if you're a player like Woodsy or... You might come out of retirement, yeah. Woodsy. Yeah, you can you can potentially get a de deal from PNG. We just pay. get looked after. Yeah, so they get everyone. Oh, yeah. Do you know? Do you know? You, you, you know, you can go up there <laughs> go, and just say there's a guy coming off on a freaking name out. Um, yeah, Kyle, right, Kyle Flanagan. You know, maybe they come in and say to Kyle. Mate, here's a four-year deal. You don't pay any tax for four years. It could set you up for the rest of your life. So that's really interesting how the clubs react to that too, Tone. Yeah, it is. And, and the red flag for me is they want to put a compound in place. And this is only hearsay coming, yeah. coming from the NRL. So how would that work if you were up there with your kids and you were actually in a compound? Because, you know, there's safety issues up yeah. there. And that's the question mark for me, like what kind of quality player? Because no one wants to see them not competitive. They need to be competitive. Like mm -hmm. what would that situation be? And that's what the clubs are interested in. This is bigger than... I was listening to um, Andrew Hill talk on a radio station. He's tied up with the PNG bid. Yeah. And he was talking about this is just bigger than rugby league. This is about um, getting play, getting young kids to go to school. So that then all of a sudden they've got an education and it picks up the economic you know, experience within the country. Kids are going to school, they're well educated, mm. brings more money into the country yeah. and you know, safety and health and all those sort of things because there's kids that don't go to school, they don't eat well and so on. So rugby league is going to try and help all these areas as well. Yeah. 
Yeah, it, it, it is bigger than the gas. It's also about China. Let's not it forget is. China. Because this, this all started because the government wanted to, uh, the federal government wanted to basically keep the Pacific out of the hands of China. I mean, it sounds ridiculous. So how, how does that work? How does that work? Because rugby league is so powerful in PNG um, that and it has the power to uh, basically influence the government and, and what the government policy and, and all that sort of stuff. So their view was that um, one of the things the federal government in Australia wanted to do was help finance a team there to help sort of keep China from taking up, basically taking over the country. It's ridiculous. I know it sounds ridiculous, but that's that's how this all started. Well, what what happens? Well, inevitably, when government changes. Well, that, no, it'll be bipartisan. The Salon, they've got bipartisan support for this this funding. Well, what happens at the end of ten years, though? Really? Well, that's an, I don't know what happens at the end of the ten that, years. That's, that's the issue as well. And I have, as I said, we haven't seen the proposal. It goes 10 years, then who takes it over? You can't possibly let Papua New Guinea run it themselves. You know there's corruption. So who's going to pick that? Are the clubs going to have to pick up the slack? And they're all the questions that we've got. So well, the government only committed to 10 years. The federal government the federal only government. committed to 10 years, Correct. yeah. Well, we'll be gone in 10 years' time. That's someone else's problem, Messi. Okay. <laughs> Fair enough. <laughs> <laughs> I guess would, would, they, would they solely play out of Papua New Guinea as well? That's it, the plan, it, yeah. is, is there Is there not... It, would it not be more attractive? Because he's in Flamengo. You mentioned these players. Well, they currently would reside here in Australia or New Zealand or England. Yeah. Yep. And again, like, you'd have to pluck them out of living in Sydney, Brisbane, Melbourne, you know, Auckland. Well, I think yeah, Messi's exactly. just suited. They're yeah. going to live in a compound if you're going to go over well, there. Well, well, still, that's, that's tough. That's tough. Yeah. Really tough. So we've been, I, I, I've, I've been over there five the, times. Yeah, it's a tropical And you've stayed country. in it. Yeah, maybe you stayed in that compound. It's diff, they tell you not to go outside of it at mm. all. And it's a tropical country, which is, it's tough living conditions. Mm. Like, that's why they've got to offer the incentives, right? The tax incentives, because, and, and as Flano said, if you, have, if you have a majority of PNG players who, that that's what they're used to, right? And just say you have 20, 22 players from PNG and you just bring in seven, eight guys from Australia or England, um, it's, I think it's doable. Um, so, but that's what they're going to have to do and that's why they need time for, to to set the pathways up and get the pathways right and get the systems right so that players, they, they can generate their own players and their own talent because then you don't have that issue with moving families families on mass to compounds in PNG. Mm. But there's always going to be players go there. If you offer guys tax incentives where they're yeah. playing 5%, 10% tax, you can have guys go there. Yeah, I think you'll get staff there as well. Yeah, of course. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, well, we've got the, staff over there, don't they? Joey Grimer's over there. Joey Grimer. Yeah, there's a lot of... There's a lot of would, would, the, would the clubs, would they, would they see that as a, an unfair competitive advantage? I, I think it becomes part of the whole package. Uh, so the clubs are for expansion because of the broadcast deal, but I think what it looks like at the end, I, I think, you know, ultimately it's not all about money either. Like there's mm. some growing of the game. Like Vegas, you know, we're all on board for Vegas. We know it's better for the game and clubs are on board, but I think it's what ultimately what the benefits are long-term to the clubs, um, both from a participation point of view and, and financial point of view to the game. Really, if we have Perth and we have uh, Papua New Guinea, where does the 20th team belong? I think they'd. I think they'd love it to be South Island New Z of New Zealand and to make like a rivalry between yeah, the coral mines. Based at a Christchurch, and there's I think at least two bids from the South Island New Zealand. One involving the uh, former uh, NRL CEO Dave Moffat and the former rugby boss Andy Marinos. They're in partnership on a bid. Uh, to be based at a Christchurch. There's a bid out of Central Queensland, um, and there's a bid out of uh, there's a the Brisbane East bid, a Ips Ipswich Jets bid. So there's a few bids out of South East Queensland. But I think they'd love a South Island New Zealand bid just because again, it 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 strengthens the Pacific ties. You get that New Zealand rivalry. You can get television money out of New Zealand, and it just make, makes a bit more sense. Particularly with rugby, rugby's struggling a bit. Well, not struggling, but it's not as powerful as it once was in New Zealand. So I think r rugby league can see some real, real inroads over there. And you talked about um, pathways and getting players and and generating players. I think, Flanny, you mentioned Melbourne, Mel uh, Victoria, and Victoria, um, they've just lost their rugby team, the Rebels, they're gone. And I know Frank Panissi now, one of Frank's major jobs is getting the pathways right in, Mel in Victoria because one thing they haven't done in their existence is mm -hmm. produce a lot, of, a lot of players out of Melbourne, but there's a real opportunity now with rugby struggling to get the pathways just right at the storm and get players coming through there. There's areas where the game can... Um, 
organically grow and it's not not too much effort. I mean, just getting your pathways right in PNG, the Pacific and Melbourne, you're going to produce a lot more footballers. Yeah, so we, we get that production pathway yeah. working. If we get to 20 teams, uh, will we still play 27 rounds with as many fixtures or the idea to be reduced the workload on the players, but then does that affect the whole, well, one of the main reasons for bringing in these new teams, which is mm. revenue, because I'm assuming the broadcasters pay, it's not just for the whole of game, they would break it down. Each game is worth X amount of dollars. So if we yeah. increase the the number of teams, but we reduce the fixtures, then it wouldn't make financial sense. Uh, it won't. I think you've got to look at the, as I said, the whole package and say, how can we play as many games, including rep games and origin or what have you? Um, but I think the important thing is to even the draw up. I think that, you know, the way it splits itself now, um, somehow we t- they've spoken about conferences, but it could be you play every team at least once and then there could be in your conference. So that will somewhat even it up than where what we're getting now. How would uh, you split the conferences though? But, well, this is it. This always interests me. We talk yeah. of conferences, then people go, Well, you just have a Sydney conference, but then that's unfair on the other teams outside Sydney. They do all the traveling. So, how, how we generate bigger fixtures? But how, how do we yeah, separate I, the sides? Look, I, I don't know the detail, just been spoken about. Um, and I'd like to see every team at least play it once. Yeah. And whether you then play if, uh, other games to get to a kind of a 27 games is another thing. But um, I think conferences is an option and an option coming from the area. So I don't know the detail, like I said, but um, there's definitely a better way to do it than what we're doing now. Flannel, do, do you have any thoughts on... Yeah, I've heard very similar to Mezzi about, you know, play everyone once and then go into conferences. But, you know, it's sort of jumping on the back of what you were saying as well, you know, sometimes the Sydney conference is going to be the tougher maybe yeah. or, you know, they could have one strong mm-hmm. in the thing and then you've got the New Zealand component of it, you know, what sides are going to travel to New Zealand uh, if we've got two teams over there. So that's the tricky part but I think if we played everyone once, that's a really good start right. um, and, yeah. you know, even if it was just is it 20 a bit, rounds. Is it a big difference by playing everyone once, the amount of games that we play? Because there's two more, three more teams in the yeah, competition. Yeah, there's some fair fair mass here, Jimmy. So at the moment you play 24 rounds mm-hmm. and there's eight games, right, each weekend. That's 192 games. 19, if you go to 19 rounds with, with 10 games a weekend, that's 190 games. You only lose two games. So, That's what I'm saying. So it's not really yeah, a big but, difference. It's but, but the only, the only issue with that is... We've you, spent all this money bringing these teams in yeah, yeah, and we're not problem. adding to the product. Mm-hmm. We're adding to what the what we would. Well, you're, you're expanding to, your audience, though, because you bring in Perth, you bring in PNG, you bring in South Island, New Zealand. So you're expanding oh, the your audience, audience expands. Well, the, the only other thing I would say is you, the, the only problem with that is you lose some some of those big rivalries. Like Brisbane don't play the Dolphins twice. Brisbane don't play the Titans twice. Brisbane don't play the Cowboys twice. Roosters don't play South twice. Yeah. Dragons don't play Cronulla twice. So I think maybe you go to 19 and you try and keep those rivalries going. So maybe you end up, up at. 22, 23, 22 games. The teams still get a buy in that? Well, you could build them in. I mean, with Origin. Yeah. But if, if you had a short season, though, you could maybe do Origin standalone, right? You wouldn't need to... If you only played 22 rounds, maybe Origin's a standalone concept rather than... You don't need the buy. So, so there's other concepts. So you, you can play, you know, you can play the, the internationals at the end of the year. You can stand out. You can get the games definitely. But what I think, and you'd know, Flano, the draw is a big, like last year, the f- our first 10 rounds, and Woodsy would know this, like we travelled a hell of a lot. It wasn't, and Vegas, everyone was in for that, but it, it wasn't the best draw for us. So it takes all that away. It, it's a much fairer system by playing everyone once and then you might have some rivalries. Maybe you have five pools of four and then you play 22 games. So you would play everyone once and you play the four teams in your pool yeah. twice. That gets you to 22 well, rounds. Just one big ladder like we currently do. Or, or it'd be like the NFL system sort of conference yes. areas. Well, uh, you'd have to have one big ladder if you just played everyone once. Yeah, yeah, that's yeah but then, it, it, like we say, if we... If but we either have, way the draw is at the moment, it's not fair. Like, we talk about sides that make the yeah. AF top four. Like, they've always said Cronulla's had an easy draw this year. Mm. So how is... It's not fair the way it is at the moment. That's probably the, the fairest way okay. you can do it. It's just play everyone once and have a few rivalry games, play play someone twice. Like the Dragons would play Cronulla... South twice. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah, look, I think it's um, it's exciting. You know, as I said, the more teams, uh, as you said, more spectators, you know, how we get it right so the draw is more even um, is, is a tricky one. That's, that's what we've got to work with. It is one of the 
unintended consequences, we'd have almost like stronger periods of dominance by one or two teams. Like we're already seeing, you know, in all likelihood, next year's grand final, the favourites will be the repeat of the 2024 grand final. Like, is this just going to keep the the teams that are currently at the top more powerful and, you know, more likely to, to win the competition each and every year? Can, can I answer that? If I think we have to look at the recruitment part of it. the problem is that, the, and we'll obviously talk about later, um, player managers and you know drafts and so on. The way we're doing that, obviously, the better sides have gone well over a longer period. Mm. I think that's the way to change it and even it up. I think we have to look at it. Well, expansion draft. Well, so that that's in, that's in other sport and competitions. I know in, in the NHL, uh, NBA, they've utilized it. They have a draft system, and there's an expansion draft where players, certain players, are protected. Is that something that you you would could see the game entertaining. Well, yeah, it can because those like PNG, there's no doubt. Let's talk about PNG for a second. Like they need help initially, right? And if you heard a draft system in, it'd make it a lot easier from the beginning. I mean, obviously the Dolphins have gone really well. They've got a, a good squad. They've been highly competitive. But say a side isn't competitive and they're getting done every week, like that's not going to be good for anyone. So how do we assist them um, to be stronger and more competitive, you know? From the get go, Woodsy's right. You need to give them more time. The Dolphins didn't, and the Dolphins did really well because only had eighteen months. Well, you, you know what? I reckon the Dolphins did really well uh, is because who they recruited, not players, coach Wayne, Wayne. Wayne. Uh, get Wayne there. He attracted mm -hmm. and Peter O'Sullivan were there as yep. well. So you've got probably one of the better recruitment officers in the game, um, and you have got Wayne who will attract players. Yeah. So, well, I they, they think they want Wayne to be the coach of PNG, if if at all possible. I think that that would be the NRL's dream. Mm -hmm. Is he interested in that? Well, I, th I think Wayne just wants to coach and get paid, and I'm sure he'd get both if he went to PNG. Well, he's what seventy five, seventy six now. Yeah, he's, like, got he's got three years at South. Three years at I mean, South. It marries off. Five, six, seven. Mm -hmm. PNG comes in in twenty eight. <laughs> I guess. Well, How much know, coin can you have? <laughs> we're not really likely to live that long. <laughs> when, when new teams come in, I guess there's success looks differently. Like I've spoken about those teams that will dominate at the top of the table. But so let's take Melbourne for instance. When they came in, well, what, what are you saying? That would mean this, the most powerful team stay there, Jimmy? Would, don't you I, think that expansion? I, I think because I, I, I really do think it would. It'd be a danger of. But you um, you look at Melbourne, right? They got picked apart by the Dolphins. They've stayed there because they're a really good organisation. But uh, two new teams coming in, they're going to go after players at Penrith. They're going to go after players at Melbourne for sure. Do you think they got picked apart? Well, I they, well, they lost they blokes, so they could probably afford yeah, to but lose. But they, they don't did. lose too many. No, they, they don't. don't lose they, kept, too many. they kept the one that they wanted the most. Yeah, well, that's true. Monster. Yeah. yeah. But again, that cost them. Well, he got paid what he deserves to be paid. Yeah. But, um, you don't think a new franchise is going to come in and go straight after Harry Grant or straight after um, those sort of guys? Like, if, you, if you're a new club, aren't they the guys you're going to chase, I would think? Uh, I honestly think we, we could be potentially going down the path of making the, the stronger clubs. Because you think they'll more, kiss their players yeah, and the yeah. others will get picked apart. Yeah. Yeah. There's no doubt the Dolphins have come in and made a, <clears throat> a large impact on the juniors. What they have done is that they put the price up for players. So, you know, I think Munster had an offer from Dolphins. Mm, you did. Um, massive. And, they, and, and then what does that do? Do they just push the price up and then Melbourne has to pay more than he was going to stay anyway? So that's the issue with the with the expansion. The, the prices will go up for everyone. But I reckon they'll pick apart the, the, the middle tier yeah. players. You know, the ones that they sort of... You probably don't expect to go so well. They do. They won't have that depth that they normally have in the last couple of years. The they're the ones the they're going clubs. to attack. Yeah. Yeah. But, the good clubs, yeah. Well, you look at uh, it's interesting. Um, someone sent me... Uh, Smith and all that. They'll well, go after those sort of... Someone sent me the ladders the other day of Penrith, um, the lower grades. And in recent years, Penrith's always done really well in lower grades. But this year, they struggled a bit because I reckon that's from clubs picking apart... You know, guys like Azara, Azara Katoa and going out mm. uh, a Yongi, the young kids there now, mm. rather than tugging those guys in the top squad, they're going underneath and grabbing the next generation of players from clubs like Penrith. And it, in the long term, that's going to affect them. Yeah, and then it's not just other clubs picking the best kids out of Penrith. The kids in Penrith are going, well, you know, I want to play NRL, so I might have to go somewhere else. You know, yeah, it's a bit exactly. of both. You know, it's not just clubs picking apart Penrith juniors. You know, some of those younger kids are going, well, unfortunately, I'm going to have to leave my club to get an opportunity, and it just happens. 
in terms of what success looks like, I think let's take the Melbourne organisation for an example. I think they needed to win premierships in order for them to make an impact in Victoria. I don't think a, a, a team in Victoria just not making the eight would be successful. I don't know if it would survive. I think if we look at PNG, there are, there's a way to make that franchise successful, like the impact in schools and obviously strengthening the bond in terms of government, the, the actual feel-good factor um, of a team being there. But a, but a team like Perth, do they need success in, in order to make an impact like almost instantaneously? Yeah, I would think so, Jimmy. I would definitely think so that, you know, especially, um, you know, in a state that's going to be competitive with other codes, that you need to get off, you know, to a good start. Um, and how do you do that? How do you guarantee that? That's a tricky one as well. But I think obviously the coach and the recruitment officer is a, probably a really good start there. Um, you know, you have a look at, you mentioned Melbourne. Melbourne, um, you know, from my perspective as a coach, I've always, you know, as long as I've been coaching, originally it was Cameron Smith, Billy Slater, Cooper Cronk, and they had this group and we all thought once they'd gone, here's our chance, we're going to get Melbourne. And it just keeps rolling on, you know. Harry comes in, Pappenhaus and Munster, they've done a really good job in key positions. Um, so, you know, take a leaf out of their book. The Dolphins, you could take a leaf out of their book because I reckon they've got a good, really good start. So the new franchises need to look at those clubs. Tony, you mentioned something before about um, the, the clubs having basically, that they, they run the game, they own the game. The, the club licenses are currently up. We, and I, I said about the, the Perth bid not basically paying a license fee. Is there a danger that the clubs split from the NRL? There's no talk about that at the moment, obviously. Um, because the, li up, the license is... It, it's about to come up. It's about expired, hasn't it? Yeah, it's going to come up in this it. month. It'll be expired. So it's quite an interesting period um, in the game because <laughs> that hasn't happened. I've only obviously been in my role two years and previous I couldn't remember, you know, when that was up. So it's a quite an interesting time when you've got expansion on the table and you've got the club's licences up. So, look, the clubs are responsible. We're not going to, you know, go off and we're going to do some rebel um, league, um, like Super League or anything like that. Or, you know, we're in this together, but at the same time, you know, we, we want the financial returns um, and have a say. It gives I suppose you the it, power though, Tone. It, it does, but we just want to say in the direction of the game. Not, we, we don't run the game as such. Um, the NRL does that, but all we want to do is be involved in that process and some transparency about it. And um, that, that's all we're wanting. At the and moment. if you agree, Tony, is this going to be another one-year deal or...? I, I don't know. I, I no, I think they're know. talking five. If you agree, it's five to ten, I think. Five yeah. to ten. I, I don't, don't know. We're still talking about lifetime licenses, but that, that went by the wayside. Yeah, it, it did. That, what Woodsy saying is if we couldn't come to a grand, would there oh. be a year just roll on to keep going? I think that's... Well, this year, rolled up, this year was a rollover for one year because they couldn't get it done last year. Okay. Yeah. So I think they... they what, what could make it done last year? I don't know. That's messy. <laughs> I think the clubs just want more transparency. Yeah, we get the deal. So, yeah. um, so like, that, like what? The what? broadcast deal. Um, just some trans. We're not. We're not saying we're going to run the deal, but all we want to do is some visibility over what, it. What? What, 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 what information are you actually? Oh, just to see what they do, because no one knows what the the um, let's say the broadcast deal is as such. So we just want visibility over. I think it's a, a fair enough ask um, because it does affect us because it affects what money we get. So. Um, we just, that, that's all the clubs want. You don't, you're not asking for a seat at the table, are you? You just want consultation, right? That, Spot on. Consult yeah. with you. Right. So, you, basically you don't have a seat at the table? No, because they don't have a say in, I don't think they want to particularly be sitting there during the negotiation process with nine Fox and having their two bobs with. I think they just want to be, right. be able to, when the NRL sits down with nine of Fox, they just want to be, at the end, at end of the day, they come back, they yeah. say to the clubs, look, things went well today, we're looking at this, we're looking at that, and they talk about it. So at least the clubs are aware of it. Yeah, that's uh, that's all we want. We're not running any negotiation because it, it adversely affects us. And, like, we, we, we wouldn't have a clue what the current broadcast deal is really because so all we're saying is we – and there's a few other parts of the game we'd like to have some transparency on as well. What about potentially buying Super League? I like um, it. Oh, I personally like it. Um, we saw on the weekend the Wigan one, and that's you a game. You bring that up, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so, sorry about that, James. Um, but, you know, they're, they're going into a period where we're going to back dominating game, which is not good for the game. They've got more money than anyone else. We've got a new owner. 
So the game over there is in trouble. Like, like we're talking about, the participation's down. I think we need them to be strong for our game to be strong. So I'd like to see um, if it's not any kind of ownership, I'd like to see some kind of connection there because I think it's really important. I was um, playing when they had the uh, World Club Challenge. We played three three games um, in England and, and three games over here. Um, I remember going. Yeah, 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 yeah it was good. ones against Cremor. So, so I, was, I was at Castleford that year. It was outstanding. Yeah, it was outstanding. <laughs> so I, whether, you know, it just brought a bit of a difference to the game it was in the middle of the year, whether we bring that back. But I think there needs to be connection for the, the long-term benefit of the game. But that... I, I remember back then that would break a couple of clubs over there. You know, they, you know, they, they just haven't got the financial clout no. behind them. So, you know, we're, you know, the NRL to take over Super League. Um, I'm not quite sure. Philandis is that silly to buy a sinking ship? Mm. You talked about yeah. participation, and you know, we're talking about pathways and so on. Wow, we're just talking about PNG, and then we're talking about going back over there where they've tried for 50, 60, 70 years to get this model right, and they can't get it right. Could could we condense the competition over there? I mean, look, without insulting all the, the any UK listeners and the and the UK clubs to to buy the Super League, you know, maybe pick six clubs to be part of the NRL competition and have a, you know, a. a, a that would increase the number of teams, increase the broadcast yeah. revenue, yeah. you know, it, it would help the profile of them. And, you know, unfortunately, the ship is, or it certainly appears like it is sinking, but there is obviously, there's quality players over there that yep. could add to what we currently have now. I know it's a 24-hour flight, but if we talk about conferences, we could have like a six-team conference there that could come over here and play and we could play in blocks where teams would go over there and play in blocks and things like that. Yeah, you could, and you could make that the world championship. I know, it's, mm. you know, we could have our competition and that run. You know, you look at um, English Premier League, they're playing so many different competitions. I know it's a different game and the impact on the athlete is different, but I think there's a, there, where there's a will, there's a way. Um, and I think if we really care about the game, we're probably got to look at something like that. And I think it'd be a great idea if we could have uh, a competition run in parallel with our, our game. Um, that'd be fantastic. Love to go and cover that, Jimmy. Oh, Six weeks in England, oh, that'd be great. Right. That'd be all right, wouldn't it? Yeah, you can't find be cheap. Junk. They wouldn't be cheap. You can't find a junk. Yeah. Well, I mean, if we if we've gone to Vegas, yeah, like you know, I, I don't mind the idea of buying a, at least some form of ownership in Super League. Surely you get it dirt cheap; wouldn't cost you a fortune. Yeah. Just buy fifty percent or fifty one percent, and 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 you would save money because there's. Um, there's a, there's certain aspects of both competitions that you could. You would save money on just by because uh, I, you wouldn't need to double, double, double dip in terms of um, potential employment and stuff like that. So I, I don't know. I wouldn't. I don't mind the idea. I think it's not a bad yeah. idea. Maybe the uh, NRL's going to buy a few more planes. Yeah, that's Maybe you're talking about buying one. We might need a few more. <laughs> you need a bigger one. Yeah, yeah. do we? Yeah. Some little charge. Sure, sure. <laughs> sure. Hey, on, on some of the expansion chat. Well, why do we have this fixation with the the connection to, to the past? It, you know, teams like the, the Jets and the Bears. Are, are we are we best to, to to move away from that and and start fresh? Well, no, because I think the idea of bringing the Bears in, Jimmy, is you get an automatic uh, um, supporter base. Okay, there's a lot yeah. of Bears fans out there, right, who desperately um, want to see that football club back and that emblem back in the game. And I reckon the idea, the NRL's idea, is. Um, Obviously, if you bring in Perth, you make them the Perth Bears. Suddenly, you're going to have eyeballs on this team because it's the Bears. When they come to Sydney, you're going to have fans going to games because it's the Bears. I think it's a really smart idea by the NRL. If, they, if they're playing like... And the Bears don't have any... The interesting thing is, Jimmy, the Bears have a logo and they have a name, but you know what? All the power will reside with the other side because they're... They're forking over the money, and they run. They will run the club. The Bears will just uh, well, give. Have any games in North Sydney? They'll, I think they'll play manly there. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> <laughs> well, true. And you know what? For yeah. Amazing yeah. rivalry. It'll be great for our oh. rivalry. In all seriousness, I'll be yeah. honest. I mean, I think they're talking about playing maybe one game in North Sydney. Yeah. yeah. So you know, it just brings uh, there's just this latent supporter base. You still see people getting around North City Bears. Mm. One of my good yeah. mates is a North City Bears fan. I went to a game the other, other week at a core. I can't remember what the game was. Wore his Bears jersey. So you know, you 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 all there's just all these supporters who come out of the woodwork you find if the Bears come back. Yeah. So because because I did read somewhere they they were hoping for like four home games. At yeah, North I think that's wishful thinking. That's, that's not that's happening. where it's like 
you know, that probably gets yes, one and a half again. Six and one half doesn't have the other. It's yeah, like, it, Woody's right. They might play a trial game or two there, but um, from memory, the, the deal, the initial deal, and that's obviously fallen over now, was going to be one game at North Sydney. But now, well, now, if the NRL now runs a club, the NRL will make a decision on that. Yeah. But if you can have a team in Perth, you want, you want, you, you Western want. Australian fans to support it, which is ultimately what already, you yeah. really want. You've got to be playing most vast majority games in Perth. Rick, you spoke about last time we were together about the NRL owning or running a club, about, yeah. you know, the, all the eyeballs on the club. Are they getting any favourites favorites here? And, you know, there's obviously a bit of an issue when the go sorry the governing body owns one club. Yeah. They, they, they'd prefer, obviously, for someone, another owner to come in, wouldn't they? Well, yeah, they will. Uh, uh, as I said, I think initially they'd have control of it and then maybe down the track they'd sell it. But it's interesting, Flano, that you look in uh, the AFL, right? The AFL run GWS. The AFL are going to run Tasmania. And, and we don't – it seems to be accepted in that in that, that sport. And, you know, people talk about rugby league and the clubs and uh, maybe the game. I, I don't want this to be offensive to clubs, but people say the game needs to grow up, right? So there's a, there's a, a side of it also you go, well, this is for the betterment of the game. At the moment we haven't got someone who can run it. We're going to run it for a while. Mm. But it helps everyone in the long run because potentially the idea is you have more games, more eyeballs, it grows your television revenue, that flies back to the club. So, you know, I, I, I don't think there'd be an issue, Messi, did No, No, there wouldn't be an issue because I was at Gold Coast when the NRL did own yeah. it. And now, obviously, Daryl Kelly and Rebecca Fazell own it and it's really stabilised it. How did that work, Messi? Did, did the NRL... They just put someone in from memory, didn't they? I can't remember who it was. Who it was, was um, Graham Annesley, was it? Graham Annesley was originally there, but obviously then he stayed on the whole time. So you work with the NRL around the finances and it really stabilised it because obviously they were funding it for a certain period until, you know, you got your head around the processes, the financial components of it and the football. And now, um, you know, I don't know if it was, but it looks profitable, so which is a good thing. But it does give it that stabilisation. How, how long do you have to to show to the NRL that you can prove that you can look after it on your own? I'm not sure. I was only um, I was only there a couple of years, so um, that I don't I don't know how long ago they bought it. But what it did though, that initial period it was really difficult. They helped with that, so there will be difficulty with Perth because don't forget the original Western Reds they went broke. Yeah, and it is a tough um, AFL market. There's two sides in there. And the Dockers and the West Coast, which are well established. The clubs get so much money now, though, from head office. You know, what do you get, $70 million a year or something, which covers the, yeah. you know, covers, <laughs> covers the salary cap. Yeah. And then it's just basically you're running your football club. Yeah. So, you know, clubs should all make profits now. They should, yeah, true. Why, why, did, why did the previous Perth team not work? For memory, I think it happened because the game came, didn't it? It fell over yeah. because the game came back together and some clubs had to go because of that. Yeah. For memory, when they shut that team down, it had money in the bank. It was mm. profitable. Right. So it's just because that, to, um, when they merged the comps, they had to reduce the teams and they were one of the teams that went by the wayside. Rudy, you said about the, the AFL and they own GWS and the Tasmanian team. That is surely to put more money into pathways there. I'm assuming, like, that, that's that's got to be why you'd take control because you'd want more kids playing AFL in, in Western Sydney. So if the N NRL... Hasn't over, really worked to me, I don't well, think. Well, I, I know, but they're still pumping so much money in, Oh, yeah, into a lot it, of money. Like, a lot of money into it. Would, yeah. the clubs fate, would the clubs oppose that if if the NRL owned the team in Perth or owned the team in PNG or, or in New Zealand and they put more resources into those areas as opposed to the, the, the current areas that currently exist, would, would there be opposition to that or would be that seen as a well, way to grow? Thing. Yeah, it's a good thing. Yeah, look, I, I think for the clubs, like I said, you you got to back the expansion because ultimately it's going to be better for everyone. So I don't think um, the clubs would be opposed to it. Uh, I really don't. It, I think um, also the Suns are owned by the AFL. Yeah, so um, all areas, they're so really looking to get yeah, a bit of fans. So it does work. It worked with the Gold Coast, actually, as I said to you, with the NRL. So... I wouldn't be opposed. Obviously, financially, it needs to stack up after a certain period. So I'm speaking on behalf of the college, which I really should. <laughs> Not in a position to. <laughs> but I was saying, from my point of view, um, from the expansion, I don't think, you know, I'd be opposed to and it. And, you know, down the track, Jimmy, if you can stabilise that franchise in Perth and make some money and shows it's profitable, you can sell it. And ultimately, the clubs will share in those profits, you'd imagine, down the track. So. Yeah. And they're all franchise, they're worth a lot of money now. They make a lot of these clubs make a lot of money. Sure do, really. Yeah. Millions. Um, <laughs> <laughs> uh, final thoughts. We'll go uh, across the table. Um, 
where where are we at with expansion? Who would you like to see come in? I think we can all agree, Perth, PNG, tick tick. Yep. Uh, final thoughts on, on expansion, Tony, which is the the 20th team? Yeah, I, I'd, I'd like to see um, a central Queensland side in. I think a, it's a real growth area. I think southeast Queensland with Gold Coast, um, obviously the Dolphins and Broncos there is, um, it, it's a really tight market. So I, I think central Queensland's a, a real growth area, um, both from a fans and a player point of view. So I'd like to see them be the 20th team. Fun. Yeah, I'm the same. Uh, it, you know, back in the day, you used to get drive from the Gold Coast to Brisbane, and it was a lot of empty spaces. You know, bush, and you drive from Gold Coast to Brizzy now. It is houses all the way along. You know, the development along there, that co part of the area. I know the Gold Coast have taken over that, but mm. you know, the Ipswich and you know all that area is just footy heartland, and I think that'd be a great place for us to look at. On your South Island in New Zealand, the Christchurch bid, because you know a lot of sides tend to get a lot of recruitment from, uh, you know, the New Zealand kids over there. So if we can keep growing the game there, you've seen what the Warriors movement was like two years or last year. They got right behind it and the rugby union is not as strong as what it once used to be. Jimmy, I reckon we don't finish 20. I reckon we get to 22. What? Down the oh. track. Down the track. Yeah. Are we bringing in South yeah. New Zealand? Uh, oh, I like Brisbane. Brisbane, Brisbane. Western Brisbane, Ipswich and Central Queensland. We get to 22 eventually. Maybe in 2040 or something. The game will be long gone, but anyway. Just a thought. So just play rugby league all year round. Yeah, why not? I'm trying to think how old we'd all be. Well, too old. 22 teams. Mate, why not? Why Dream, not? Dreaming big, really. I like well, it. Yeah. Well, why not? I mean, that, as Flano said, that western part of Brisbane, awesome. that's rugby league heart. And AFL is trying to creep in there. I think they're based at out western, out, out western Brisbane somewhere. Springfield, I think it is. And then Central Queensland, again, rugby league heartland. Where would that be based in Central Queensland? Rockhampton? Rocky. Rocky. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. So 22, well, Jim. Well, we talk about not having enough players now. <laughs> no, no key. Mm. It'd be interesting. I, I, I'm I'm thinking around the, sorry, the the Super League. I I, I think that, that there's something there that can be revived and, and actually add to our competition. And, and maybe when we look at conferences, that's some serious consideration around having a conference based out of of England or, or Europe with the, the Catalan Dragons as well. So, uh, But a great chat on expansion. Um, I guess it's a bit of a watch this space because do we have any... Uh, not we, really, no. We're looking, we're, looking in, we were, we were looking initially at, um, in November there was going to be an announcement and I'm not sure whether this Perth Bears issue pushes things back, back but I'd expect November. The yeah. government's really pushing to get a, an announcement on PNG. So... I think they want to announce the two of them at once. So, you know, there's a bit of bit of there's a bit of urgency around it. Yeah. Well, another great episode, Charlie, and we are in now to the fan section. All thanks to Lab Rogues, where we look at some of the questions, comments from YouTube, and address some of the issue and thoughts of our loyal fans and listeners. So, what have we got for us, Charlie? That's certainly right, Jimmy. Obviously, this show really it's all about the fans. Anyway, like it's kind of hoping to give listeners, viewers, a glimpse into a rugby league boardroom. That's the whole point yeah. of the show. And Ladbrokes, you're right, are going to own the fan section of this. And first of all, we'll be just going through the comments from different mm -hmm. episodes so far, from the refereeing episode and then also the player movement episode as well. Um, and one of the big discussions in the player movement episode was the draft, um, which has got a lot of people fired up. And the name that's come up in the comments though is Terry Hill. The first question that we're going to get to, Jimmy, here is from at Mr. Carrera 28, who says, stop discussing the drafts. It is such a waste of time. After Terry Hill's court case, it was ruled illegal and therefore it would be virtually impossible to implement. It would only take one player or a club to challenge the draft and it would be thrown out. And a couple of people didn't know what that was. So they replied as well. So I'll just read this other comment as well that explained it. Um, Hill's greatest influence on the game was changing the draft system. Hill became embroiled in the external and internal draft system in the 1991 season when after agreeing to a playing and employment deal with the Western Suburbs Magpies, he was drafted from the internal draft pool by Eastern Suburbs. Hill and 126 other plaintiffs took the New South Wales Rugby League to court, arguing a draft was a restrict. Argu arguing the draft was a restrict a restraint on trade. Well, Terry Hill was possibly correct. Uh, he won that battle in court, but I would argue the draft can exist because in the same country of law, it exists in one of our rival sporting co codes, the AFL. So 
you know, you could argue there all it would take in the AFL is one of the players or one of the clubs to take that system to court and it would be shut down. So the fact that it does exist, we would need to examine how and why it flourishes and exists in the AFL. And I'm imagining it is more to do with the CBA. I don't know what if if and what, what the CBA looked like when Terry Hill was around and playing. I'm going to make an educated guess and say it either didn't exist or it wasn't as effective of what it is now. The terms and agree and terms and conditions of being a professional rugby league player now are pretty much watertight. Um, it is interesting how sports law, uh, employment law, um, change over time and how they. You know, the, the usual employment law versus the sporting employment law, it probably depends on who is on uh, the jury or the judge and how they see things, whether they, you know, we, we do talk in the player welfare section around what is deemed acceptable punishments for being late. Like, can you apply the same employment law to a corporate office as a sporting organization? I would argue, no, they are similar, but also very different. And, you know, even now we've had the, the Mark Bosnan who took, um, I think, maybe FIFA or UEFA to court around how uh, his restriction of trade, a club couldn't own a player if they were off contract. Um, recently, Lasana Diara, uh, I'm not too sure on how that court case um, or the impacts of that court case, I know that it found in favour of Diara, so we'll yet to see um, how that will be implemented around the, the, the basically the current transfer system there are elements of it that are unlawful so look this is um an evolving space uh, as sports become increasingly professional um but i think the very fact that the afl has a draft system implies that the nrl could if they wanted to pursue they could bring in and implement a draft system at steve 9484 says the salary cap can work all it needs is a cap on third-party payments and a rule stating that players can't sign for a club for less than 95% of their maximum offer. And I think he raised a really good point with third-party payments. Listening back to the show, I thought something is probably we didn't talk about yeah. that we probably should have. Um, but what do you make of that? Yeah, well, look, third-party payments are, are an interesting one. I guess what defines a third-party payment is this, you know, we – They've been available in our game, but the club can't source them or they certainly can't guarantee them, but they can be written into the contract from, from memory. Um, we talk of a restriction on trade. Well, you know, going back to the previous um, question, well, the salary cap is a restriction on trade. Mm -hmm. The salary cap itself is illegal. And this leads into that question around third party agreements, capping them, that is a restriction on what a player can earn. Hmm. Like a salary cap is restricting what a player can earn. Like the Penrith Panthers or the Sydney Roosters, like the, I'm sure there's plenty of teams that would love to get rid of the salary cap. But I think what we agree is it's for the greater good of the game. Now, in terms of putting a cap on third party payments, like I just don't know if that's possible to do. Hmm. The only way it could be possible to do is if the players were to hand over their bank details to a to the governing body, basically. An auditor, basically. And yeah, just mm. to figure out what's coming in and what's going out. That's yeah. the only realistic way you could do it, but then you've got family members, like... Yeah, and also cash. You, you, well, you, <laughs> you could, you could yeah, open up well, to you that, could, yeah, in you all could honesty. Open up to, to, to old school cash. You yeah. Could, you, but then, really, if you wanted to dig into that, you could see about the cost of living, why these guys not seem to be paying off you then you've got players who you know it's something i i exercised the right to do and get opened up i think it was a family trust where you know your certain earnings go into that mm. which again that you'd have to be transparent on that so look in order to create create absolute fairness the third party uh, payments is undoubtedly an issue but how that is policed and controlled like i think the nrl manage it in, and say you, it can't be a connection to the club directly uh, and it can't be guaranteed 
So that's the way that they work. Um, I really like this next comment coming from at Will McLaughlin, 7166. He um, he breaks down how he thinks the um, trade deadline free agency should all work. So he said, this is what I would do. Sort of follows the NBA. We'd have a trade deadline of June 30. Teams can make trades before then. Contract extension deadline would be August 1st. Teams can re-sign their off-contract players. However, players can opt to wait until free agency. Free agency would begin one week after the NRL grand final. Players can then sign those free agents and the trade period also reopens for the following season at this point. You can add in team options on final years or qualifying offers. Teams can offer a contract to a player with their team within their team options in their final year and clubs have a chance to match that offer or let them go. And the draft would be the last Monday and Tuesday of October with exempt players um, available to skip that. November 1, preseason begins and players off contract for the following year can extend with their current team only. Well, th- that's not too far away from one of the, the suggestions that I had where basically you can elect to re-sign or you, you, you wait and then go into um, the free agency period and there's, a, there's room to manoeuvre in the middle of the season if a player wants to move or a club want to some, have some moving parts. I think it's... I think it's it's for for me. I'm of the opinion that this is going to happen. It, it will come back in. Yeah. Um, it's going to require uh, a little bit of give and take. The players are going to have to give some things up. I know if I was currently playing, I would probably be against it. Um, but that said, for the greater good of the game, I, I, I think it. I think it helps the overall experience for more stakeholders. Are you worried that with the, all the like all the drama we had with the CBA, like was that last year even, and the the, kit, the like the RLPA kicked up so much fuss over really small things, something like this would just be such a huge drama. Oh n- no doubt, it would take a, a lot of um, sorting out, Charlie. Like yeah. a lot of sorting out. I just can't see it happening in the well, next fifteen years, anyway. Well, m- maybe, m- maybe, but look, the the, the I guess the big losers in this would be the players. Like they have very little to gain. Yeah. Like very little to gain. Well, nothing to gain really, except for maybe it drives more interest. But you could yeah. argue that our current November 1 setup means that player movements in the headlines throughout the year. Yeah, you could. Uh, if, yeah, for me, the, the, the players are not going to relinquish this benefit. They'd be silly too without a fight or without a, a something in return. Um, last one then before you go and look at some of the refereeing questions. At C... JH94, the reason Penrith juniors are great is because of the Penrith system. You take them out of that system into a shit system, they won't get half the development they need. They've got a very good point. The environment is so important. We've recently had Matt Cameron on um, from the Penrith Panthers who spoke at length about the the junior development system, how um, that helps the individual grow, some of the traits that they look for, Um and a lot of clubs just aren't as good as Penrith. Maybe perhaps that they don't invest as much in it because it's not give them much fruit over the, the past number of years. So they don't really see the point. They're more of a, a recruitment style um, team or, or, or develop a little bit later on. But certainly at Penrith, they, they develop their juniors on the pathway with the idea that they're going to play first team. And, and I think some other clubs need to to take some lessons from the Penrith Panthers, would they be as good? Probably not because they don't have the sheer numbers of participants that, that play. It's a similar thing like why do it? Why do England not produce a, a enough players to be super competitive? It's, it comes down to sheer participation numbers. If you if you are interested in the Penrith Panthers and their whole setup, Matt Cameron, it came out on Sunday, would highly recommend you go back and watch that because incredible chat, great, great person and... Very deep thinker for rugby league. Yeah, what a fantastic uh, interview that was. I um, thoroughly enjoyed that one. It was it was fantastic and opened my eyes to the numerous situations that are, are going on there at the Penrith Panthers. All right, then at Oriel Guri Perez one one six six. Maybe NRL should copy soccer and have a bunker, but the main referee should be the one that says the last word. Uh, I'm going to say a big no. Because VAR doesn't seem to be working, so the referee has to run over to the box yeah. and, and see what's going on. Like, 
for, for me, the the technicalities in 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 the in the Premier League of like is it a goal? Isn't it a goal? The offside, like they are playing to the letter of the law. They're drawing lines on the pitch. We've seen goals disallowed because you know an, half a knee is in front for for offside, which again technically they're the correct decision. But that referee running over, looking in the box, like you just. I don't know if we've got the capabilities to do that here. I think it opens up far too much room for error. I think the fact that it is moved to a third party, it's, le le sorry, an outside of the ground um, area where there's no emotion involved. I, I just think, you know, in, in reflection, some of the things like Reedy spoke about, even recent chats with Volandis and Abdo, the bunker do an um, overall an amazing job. It's just the ones that they get wrong that... We tend to focus on how can we improve those decisions. Again, my idea of a, th a three-person panel, I think that alleviates more clangers. Mm. Like you know, the, the referee, the idea of the referee going to to view it, one, it it, it takes more time. I think it's going to create more of a delay in the decision decision making process, which we all know is an important part of it. Like we need things to quicken up, not slow down. And unfortunately, I think that idea would slow things down and the emotion of the occasion could affect, like the referee can't communicate properly. Can't the, the referee, he or she can't see as much when, they, when they're in such a, a crowded space. Uh, at Dave B3987, I really believe all we need is on-field decisions made and the only time the bunker comes into it is with the captain's challenge. This will put the onus on the players to know when to challenge and if they don't like it, it was likely good enough and the 50-50 decisions will just be accepted. Well, look, I'm not in total disagreement. I think we need it for try scoring opportunities though. We need it for try score. Why couldn't you just check captain's challenge if you're not sure about it? Because though? the game yeah, and you give you give every club nah, two a half or I, something like that. Charlie. We need it for tries. But you will just do. you'll just blame the team though for not having you nah, say their challenges for those moments. It, you just pe people have no idea how fast and how fine the margins are, you need to check almost there. Well, and every try is now checked because we've missed some. Like it never used to be. It used to, if you remember back to the old model, it was the referee would just give a try mm. or it would send it up and say, yeah, no try or- And they used to send everything up basically. A lot of the time, yeah. yeah, but then they missed a few. I think it was the Bulldogs South game about three years ago just before the semi-finals, and I think they missed one of the Bulldogs players or the Souths player putting their foot into touch mm. in the act of scoring a try. And everyone's like, why don't we check that? Why don't we just check every try? And I think- But you could if the, they challenged it. Well, you could, yeah. But <laughs> if the time taken in order to get the decisions right for try scoring opportunities, I think is it, it's a price worth paying that oh. we need to persist with. Our game would look horrendous if if- that was implemented. But you've got horrendous. the captain's challenge there. So if you want to, you've got two and a half. Use them wisely. If you're successful, you can have infinite number of challenges. Yeah, look, it, it's not the way I want our sport to look. I don't I don't think that that is – I think it sounds great in theory, but I think in, in practice would look terrible. I think I like where his heads are there. NBA did something similar. With um, they used to review everything in the last two minutes, and now they only check something if the other team challenges it, like or calls for a review. So the coach does that, and you've got one in the last two minutes. You get it right, you can have it. You can um have another one. You get it wrong, you lose your timeout, all this sort of stuff. So yeah, look, uh, just because it works in basketball, it, it's it's a different. NFL is maybe similar as well with with the challenges. I don't know if they review every touchdown. I'm not a big NFL guy. No, they they, they do. They review yeah, every, every touchdown. touchdown. Yeah. yeah. So yeah, maybe that's the, the mod. Maybe well, that's the model. Well, and that's what we have. No, but we no, nah, but the we come in for all sorts of different stuff. Yeah. Like. Oh, sorry. Yeah, but because the value of scoring, the, the value of scoring a try, is so important. Like a touchdown, it's it's yeah. so important versus you know NBA games of a hundred you know points scored. Uh, from from each team, or, you know, yeah, yeah, yeah. So the value of scoring it, it's a rare occasion. So we don't, you couldn't review every bat, every slam dunk, every three point shot in basketball. It, you just take forever. Yeah, but I think in a sport like league, you need to review them. Um, one of the con one of the things um, that 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 listener is talking about is the fact that too much bunker interference in in the free flow of the game. I'm I'm not disagreeing with them around. 
allowing the game to unfold. And if the referee misses it, then the referee misses it. Now, one of the consequences of that is you miss Alatrell Mitchell on Joey Manu. You miss Joseph Suwalihi on a Reese Walsh. You you miss them. You miss them in the flow of the game. So Suwalihi on Reese Walsh, you wouldn't have missed that. Like I know they played on, but it was that that was well. I, I, yeah, may, maybe Are we. I, I don't know. I don't know if we do miss that. I, yeah. I don't know. For, yeah. for me, I remember watching that game, Charlie, mm. and I was there and I didn't see it. Yeah, right. I, so I was sitting right in front of where it happened, and you like if you, I don't know how you'd miss that, or at least one of the sideline officials or yeah. something. He just took his head off. Yeah, maybe, maybe you catch it, maybe you don't. Yeah, I, I'm, and maybe one of the. The consequences of that is we hold our hands and say, look, that's how we're going to play the game. But then, look, the the game, whether you like it or you don't, um, has other, other factors pulling on it on how they make decisions and why they make decisions that aren't necessarily in, in the interest of um, the flow of the game or fan engagement. There is a... a a player welfare, health and safety aspect of the game where they're almost, I would say they're almost compelled to interject if possible on incidences of foul play. That is that is the reality of where the world is at now. Yeah, fair enough. Um, at Scott Watkins, 1328. Now this is in reference to the bunker person working, you know, all weekend. Come on, one person can surely work 10 hours and 40 minutes over four days in the bunker. I'm a tradie that has to work 45 hours a week on a site and travel time just to get to and from work can be 15 to 18 hours extra a week. Uh, on top, fuck me, maybe I should take up officiating in the bunker. <laughs> um, <laughs> look, I, I, I'm, I'm with them. Like, I, I think it's a, a job that is doable. Yeah. Uh, it, it's achievable. It will, is it demanding? Absolutely. Um, but you pay good money for someone to do that. And, and I think that you would see, you, you, would, you would see a, a, a decent level of application, uh, of, yeah. of applicants go towards it. Like it, it, is it difficult? Yeah. But a lot of, a lot of difficult jobs are out there yeah. with a lot, lot of responsibility and a lot of things riding on it because uh, yeah. And look, I, I understand it's difficult to concentrate for, for, for that level of time. Look, I, I, res I respect people that do tradies, teachers, like um, police um, officers up and down the country, you know, people that work um, for the fire service, you know, the, the ambulance drivers, the doctors that are on call for, for all hours. Like mm -hmm. I 100% I get that. And I get that this would be a difficult job that would demand concentration, but I think it, it's not beyond the, the the, the capabilities of an individual. Also, one point you raised was it's, it's highly paid and Reedy sort of shut you down and said, would it be highly paid? Well, it would be because also you could get rid of about half of the officials. Really? We you've did. got, you've yeah, got yeah, what, yeah. six different people working the bunker yeah. every weekend. I, don't, I think maybe some of them work two games, not you don't have a yeah. different bunker official for every single game over the weekend. But you get rid of all those people, so you yeah, could easily you, make it high yeah. paid. You, you wouldn't need to adjust budgets at all. Yeah, you, you reduce your costs and... Yeah, you put, put more money into it. Like, it, it it would be worth it. Yeah, absolutely. That's probably enough of the comments then for one episode, yeah. I think. Some great comments. Thank you guys for sending your questions and your queries and your comments to us. Please keep them coming. The fan engagement is such an important part of the Rugby League round table. Also, we know it's a rectangle table as well. A lot of people yeah. let us know. We know it's rectangle, but um, it is what it is. It is. It's not round. It depends on how you look at it as well. Yeah. Also, if you're listening, it could be a round table. If you're watching, you know. <laughs> also, rugby league rectangle table like doesn't have the same ring to it, does it? If we no. called it the rectangle table show. No, it wouldn't. It just no. sound stupid. Yeah. It sound like one of Charlie's not so bright ideas. Yeah, that's right. So, that's but yeah, right. thank you, fans, listeners, for sending in your comments. Please keep them coming. This is all thanks to Labrokes who make this show possible. We love doing the Rugby League Roundtable, and thank you for sending in all those queries and questions. Thank you.